Good evening. We will call to order the regular meeting of the Planning Commission for the City of Edina, February 13th, 2013. <clears throat> Jackie, would you please call the roll? Here. Here. The next item of business is the approval of the meeting agenda. You have received a copy of that uh, in your packet. Are there any additions to the agenda that we need to note? Seeing none, call for motion to approve the agenda. So moved. Second. Second. All in favor say aye. The agenda is approved. Tonight is the uh, <clears throat> annual meeting for the Planning Commission, and the first order of business is the election of officers. Uh, we have three officers, secretary, vice chair, and chair, and the uh, adoption or readoption or continuation of uh, our bylaws. Uh, you've all received uh, those in the packet. The first item of business would be the election of the chair, uh, I have served my two years as chair, and it's time for somebody new to do that. So uh, I will take uh, nominations for the position of chair. Are there any nominations? I would nominate Kevin Staunton. Name of Kevin Staunton. And Kevin Staunton has been nominated and seconded. Are there other nominations? Hearing none, <laughs> I'll call for a motion to close the nominations and to elect Kevin Staunton as chair of the Planning Commission. Is there a second? second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Chair? That's all I had to do. <laughs> I'm done, man. Don't, don't look so thrilled. <laughs> Thank you, Chair Grable, former Chair Grable, um, and thank you, fellow commissioners. Um, before we move on, I do want to just take a minute to thank Floyd for his work over the last two years. Uh, those of us who have um, pinch hit for him from time to time understand that it's no small task to lead these meetings every two weeks, and during his tenure, it's moved from once a month to twice a month, and so... Um, I, for one, appreciate uh, that effort, and you've done it with uh, grace and, uh, and style, and thank you for your service on that front. You're very kind. Thank you. Any, any success or good things that have happened on this commission while I've been chair are credit to the staff and to the other members of this fine body. Thank you very much. Thank you, Floyd. Uh, so we have two other officers. We have a vice chair position, um, which I have held uh, up until now, and then a secretary position, which Commissioner Carpenter is currently the secretary. And so why don't we just take those one at a time. Um, vice chair, I'd accept uh, nominations at this time for the vice chair. I'd like to nominate Commissioner Platter for vice chair. Is there a second? I'll second that. So, Commissioner Platter has been nominated and seconded. Are there any other nominations? Hearing none, I would, uh, I would call for a vote on the nomination of Commissioner Platter. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Congratulations, Commissioner Platter. I'll let you know now that I intend to be absent on several dates coming up soon. <laughs> Uh, that leaves us with the secretary position. Uh, are there nominations for the secretary position? Or volunteers for the secretary position? Self-nominations would be accepted. Nominate Commissioner, Potts. Uh, Commissioner Potts' name has been uh, put into nomination. Is there a second? And seconded, are there other nominations for the position of secretary? Hearing none, I'd call for a vote on Commissioner Potts as secretary for the commission. All those in favor say aye. 
Aye. Aye. Opposed? Same sign. Congratulations, Commissioner Potts. Thank you. All right. Um, the second item from the annual meeting is uh, approval of the bylaws. Are there any uh, comments on the bylaws? While people are looking, I would bring one up. And Carrie, maybe you can give us some input on this. On page 9, under officers, we note um, the officers of the Planning Commission shall consist of a chairperson, vice chairperson, and secretary elected by the Planning Commission at the annual meeting for a term of one year. Now, I know we have an exception where we can do two years on the Planning Commission. I can't remember whether we've gone through this exercise in the middle year or not. Did we? Okay, so maybe it's just fine to keep that at one year and we can revisit this a year from now. Other than that item, are there any other um, items that folks would like to discuss in the bylaws? Is there action necessary to readopt them or if we just do nothing, will they stay in place? Yeah, why don't we take an action to adopt them for this okay, year? So then I'd entertain a motion to approve the bylaws for this year. So moved. And a second? Second. Uh, having been moved and second, is there further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. And bylaws are adopted for the next year. Uh, next on the agenda is the approval of the consent agenda, which this evening consists only of the minutes of the regular meeting of the planning 23. Um, is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? Commissioner Forrest. I just noticed on the bottom of page four that it says uh, Commissioner Potts agrees with the comments of Commissioner Grable and Commissioner Potts. I think he meant Platter. So if that's. And, well, he could be very catch. agreeable and be agreeing with himself, yes. So, so it should be Commissioner Platter. Is that correct? Your recollection, Commissioner Potts? Yes. It was on the Creek House, right? Yep. Yeah. That would make sense. Okay. Right. Any, uh, any other corrections or additions to the minutes? <coughs> Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve the minutes. So moved. A second? Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? And the minutes are adopted. Next on the, uh, on the agenda is community comment. This is the portion of our meeting that is reserved for uh, members of the public to make comment on items that are not on our agenda this evening. Um, and so at this time, if there's anyone in the audience who would like to come up and provide comment, uh, we would welcome it. Looks like everybody's here for something that's on the agenda. We often have a big audience of people who are here just to see what we're up to. <laughs> uh, hearing no community comment, we'll move on to public hearings. We have several public hearings this evening, and the first is a uh, lot division at 5809 and 5813 Tingdale Avenue in Edina. Carrie? Thank you. <clears throat> Chair Staunton, members of the commission, uh, this property is located just west of Highway 100, south of Vernon on Tingdale. This is a look at the existing two properties. Notice that the existing property line between the, the two is angled. And there is currently a driveway encroachment just a little bit. Uh, the lot line is represented by the dashed line here. Um, so the existing driveway for 5813 uh, encroaches a little bit on the property to the north. What the applicant is proposing to do here is shift this straight lot line so it's bent um, slightly. It's an equal swap of 106 square feet going from each property. So the overall size stays the same. Purpose of the request is to provide a little extra room um, in moving around each home. If I go back, you can see it's, it's real tight, just uh, about two feet in this location. 
and about four feet in this location. So it's real tight getting around the two homes and also that, that encroachment. Um, <clears throat> again, as I mentioned, there's no uh, change in the existing lot size. So with that, staff is recommending uh, approval of that shift in that lot line. I can stand for questions. And uh, any questions for Commissioner for Planner Teague at this point? Commissioner Platter. Carrie, so this these houses were built on the original lines, right? I would assume so, okay. yes. I was just curious. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Potts. Carrie, do you, can you tell us uh, how the, the new line was determined? It's it's not an even split, for instance, between the the existing structures it doesn't look like um, it, it looks as though it was an they wanted to make it so it was an equal trade of land so each lot would remain the same size in trying to accomplish um, providing a little extra room to maneuver around the side of each of each home okay. so it, it looks as though it was created so it would be an equal swap of land between the two properties Okay, rather than leave an equal setback right. off of the property on each side. Okay, thank you. Further questions for Kerry? Uh, hearing none at this time, I'd open the public hearing and welcome anyone here to comment on, um, on this item. Is there anyone here who'd like to speak to this item? Seeing no one, uh, is the applicant present? Doesn't look like it. So not seeing the applicant and seeing no one who wants to participate in public comment, I'd take a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. And a second. Second. All in favor of closing the public hearing, say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right, the public hearing is closed and uh, further discussion from the Planning Commission. All right, entertain a motion if someone's so inclined. Mr. Platter. I would make a motion to accept staff's recommendation for the uh, lot division. And approve. And approval. Is there a second? Second. second. Further discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, same sign. And the motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Next up is a variance at uh, 7380 France Avenue in Edina, Minnesota. Uh, Carrie, you want to lead us through this one? Uh, thank you, Chair. I'm going to pinch hit for Joyce, who is home with pneumonia. Ooh. Uh, we have a request for a wall sign variance on France. Uh, property is located just south of Gallagher Drive on the west side of France across from the, uh, the West Elm, pinstripes, the new development there. Uh, the sign variance is to allow a 36 square foot sign that's attached to a, the, wall, the uh, south wall of the building. And the reason that the variance is asked for is the code doesn't allow a wall sign in an office district that doesn't face a public street or right of way. So currently there is a, the, the way the code reads now is you can have one wall sign that faces a public right of way and one freestanding sign. So what the applicant is proposing here is to have the one sign, the one wall sign that faces France, that would be 50 square feet. It would remove the existing freestanding sign that's out in front. And they would like to construct a wall sign this is the south-facing uh, south facing <coughs> elevation. They believe it would get, have, provide more visibility for traffic as they're uh, traveling on France rather than that, than that freestanding sign um, is lower. And given the, the speed of traffic and the amount of traffic, they'd like to, to make that change. So the variance is requested. Um, so with that and going through the, the variance criteria, staff believes that the criteria is met um, again, this property has um, the poor visibility from France, um, given the traffic and the speeds there. Also, this site is just 
of, 14, of the 14 sites that are zoned office that are located on France, three of them are not located on a corner lot. So it's somewhat unique in that we only have three office properties that um, they can only have wall signage, um, wall signage that faces the street. The city did approve a, a side facing wall sign that does not face a public street just to the south at 7700 7, France. This uh, is the Fidelity building. The sign faces to the north and it does not face uh, right of way. So some precedent has been set there as well. Uh, um, staff also believes that it's reasonable. They're not, they're not proposing um, signage that exceeds the 86 square foot maximum that's allowed between the wall sign and that freestanding sign. So with that, staff is recommending approval of the variance subject to those conditions uh, that are outlined in the staff report. And I can stand for questions. Any questions for Mr. Teague? Commissioner Forrest. Does the Fidelity Building, is that zone the same identically to this one? It is. And the other buildings that are used as an example in Exhibit B of our color examples? Some of the, those were provided by the applicant. Some of those are zoned commercial. Okay. Thanks. Further questions for Commissioner Teague? Or for Mr. Teague? Commissioner Potts. I carry the, the plan to remove the existing monument sign. Are they leaving everything else in place there's a it sits up on a a low wall do you know uh, i don't know the detailed plans for how they would remove that other than they've indicated they would be removing the signage and and i assume if anybody if a new tenant comes into this building they they can't assume they've got two wall signs and then come back and add another monument sign correct we, The question I had, Carrie, was um, it looks to me, and I can't quite tell from the map, it looks like there's a parcel 7390 immediate, immediately to the south. Is that an occupied parcel? Is that the uh, Fidelity building you were talking about? Uh, the Fidelity building is a little bit further south. I would have to look and see on our parcel map to see if that's a separate lot. Of record, I don't I guess know off the, the top of my I head. I guess the direction I'm going with this is, you know, what if that property were to redevelop in a way that would really make that south-facing sign not very valuable? Um, you know, I assume that right now they've got, they feel like they've got a line of sight down the street enough that it's worth putting it on the south side of the building. But if if there was development that came out to the street more that blocked that, would they have to come back in to revert to the monument sign or how would we handle that they would um, as I look in the conditions I would recommend that you add a condition that says that the monument sign has to be removed and so with that condition on the variance then they would have to come back um, in order to add that monument sign okay so if circumstances change in the future they could come back and right. we could figure out how to deal with it then right Okay. Further questions? Seeing none at this time, uh, we'll uh, open the public hearing and invite comment from the applicant and or the public. Is the applicant present? Yes. You want to come up and introduce yourself? And My name is Greg Colas. I represent the, the uh, uh, Marketplace Home Mortgage and Mr. White, the owner who owns the building as well. Um, I, it was pretty succinctly stated all the um, ordinances and how it applies to this. I guess you you had uh, talked about the monument. Should another development come in south of that, we would ha we would have to come in to get a, a variance to add a monument sign. Well, I suppose, you know, that's a good question for Carrie. You know, if they took off the south sign, could they go back to a monument sign? Then it would be conforming, I suppose. Yeah, that, that's a good point. Um, so we, the condition would be to remove it. I suppose the appropriate condition would be to remove it now mm -hmm. in exchange for being able to get the south wall sign. Correct. But if you went back, assuming the code was still the same and a 
future change, I, I suppose then it would be conforming. You wouldn't need a variance? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Okay. As long as you removed the south-facing right. wall sign. Right, because otherwise you'd be over your aggregate square footage. Correct. Okay. I, I've got nothing else. Then. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Collins. Thank you. Commissioner Schroeder. Uh, I actually have a question for the applicant. Oh, oh sure. Um, I just want to know how you came up putting this on the south side. Anybody approaching from the south can't turn into the site unless they go up to Gallagher Drive, make a U-turn, and come back. And on the north side, I'm assuming there is no signage. How do you decide between the south side and the north side? Um, the sight lines going, going north are much further than the sight lines coming south. Plus, it's up on a hill. It's slightly elevated, um, and it, it, it's got pretty good sight lines. And it, it looks better with the with the way the building's been um, renovated. Uh, plus, the, the monument's a bit dated, um, and we just want to like to dig that out, make it much better appearance in the front of the, the building, and give us some exposure on the south side. I think there's a little hill there as you're coming south, so you don't see it that far in advance if you're driving south, are you, after that traffic light thing? I don't know. Commissioner Forrest? Yeah, so when you've remodeled the, I see there's parking on the south side. Is that the main entrance also on the south side? That is, a, no, that's not the main entrance. The main entrance is actually on the west side. So what we would think of as the back of the building? Correct. Okay. Further questions for the applicant? Thank you, Mr. Collins. Okay. Is there further public comment? Anyone else who would like to um, comment on this application? Seeing none, I take a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. And a second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right, the public hearing is closed and discussion by the commission. Commissioner Scherer. Uh, hearing no discussion, I would move uh, approval of the variance subject to the uh, two conditions as listed in the staff report and adding the third uh, condition that the approval be subject to the removal of the existing monument signage that exists on the property. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? Commissioner Forrest. Yeah, I'm. I would say that if you look on page 4, uh, 1B under our findings is that the city's rel approved a relatively similar sign to be built on Fidelity. And that's an interesting point of history, but since we're supposed to consider every variance request de novo, I wouldn't consider that as part of the rationale for granting the variance as part of that finding. So are you proposing to amend the motion? Um, not as it reads, but it, other than when you say subject to staff report, I think that uh, that's not a finding that su adequately supports our results if we vote for it. How does the mover and the seconder feel about that? Um, I, would, I would be fine um, amending uh, the motion. Uh, to state that we would accept the staff report, but we would remove 1B and we would add condition 3, the removal of the monument signage that currently exists. And is that acceptable to the seconder? Yes. Further discussion? Hearing none, I'd call for a vote on the motion. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Collis. <clears throat> Next up is a variance at 6937 Cornelia Drive in Edina. Uh, Chris, you're going to introduce this for us. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the Planning Commission, the uh, subject property is at 6937 Cornelia Drive. It 
is a request for a 3.34 foot side yard setback variance from the minimum 10 foot setback requirement. The property is located on the east side of Cornelia, as highlighted. It is a rambler with an attached two car garage. This is the subject home as it looks today. Uh, this is the property directly to the north and the property directly to the south. Uh, the property to the south is the one affected by the variance and it's where their garage is located. So the request is actually to add living space behind the garage in addition behind the home. And the shape of the lot pies back. Um, the proposed setback is closer than the 10 foot allowed. Um, and then it also gets closer the further you go back into the rear yard. This is the home as it looks today. It won't look any different from the front with the exception of the garage will have the ridge line of the roof match the existing ridge line of the rest of the home. This is the north side of the house. Uh, the spacing between this, the homes will not change on this side. Um, it's not affected by the variance. Uh, what you should note, however, is that the setback on the north side is 6.8 feet. So the north side is already non-conforming and that's pretty typical throughout the neighborhood. The homes were built with uh, roughly seven foot side yard setbacks. They vary to some degree between less than seven feet to um, nine and 10 feet. This would be the side where the variance is being requested behind the garage. Uh, they would like to add an addition which would include living space in place of a porch that's currently there now. Uh, this is a tree that's roughly in the middle of their backyard that they would like to salvage. They don't want to take the tree down and move the addition further back into the rear yard instead of um, towards the south side of the house. This is a survey of the property illustrating the existing footprint of the home and then you can see behind it here is where they would like to add on to the back of it. Um, what you'll notice is that the sidewall of the garage is not parallel to the side lot line. So as you go further back into the rear yard, it does get closer. The garage wall is conforming because the minimum setback for garage is five feet. However, for living space, it's 10. It's currently at 7.9 feet. And then as you go further back, um, it reduces down to 6.66 feet. So the request for the variance is for that, um, the side wall on the south portion this is the existing floor plan of the house on, in the basement. The main floor, you'll see that there's a porch already behind the garage. The existing, uh, of the, the existing uh, elevations of the home. This is the proposed floor plan of the main floor. And what you'll notice is the setback line through that south wall. Um, it's angled, there's, it's a, just a triangle slice of uh, that addition. Here's a little more detail of that. So it's only this area that's in question in terms of uh, the request for side yard setback variance and then the basement as well. These are the new elevations. You'll notice that the ridge line will be brought up to match the existing ridge line of the main portion of the house. This is the new south elevation. Again, the ridge line lifts up and the addition towards the back. This is adjacent to the neighbor's garage, not their living space. Um, and then there's the rear exterior elevation. Staff believes it is reasonable to allow for the variance provided that the original home built in 1955 had existing nonconforming setbacks on the north side. The south side will simply match the existing nonconforming setbacks. Um, it will be consistent with the other setbacks that are throughout the neighborhood. The neighborhood was built primarily with uh, s tighter setbacks than what we currently allow, allow in the zoning ordinance. Um, the Minnesota state statutes require that, that um, the variances relieve a practical difficulty to prevent reasonable use of the property and that there are circumstances unique to the property that are not self-imposed. Uh, staff believes the proposed variance is reasonable given that the existing living space on the subject home on the north side is roughly the same as what they're trying to uh, achieve with the addition. And the unique circumstance of the existing home is that the applicant is asking to maintain that similar nonconforming setback um, provided on the north side. 
and provided by neighboring homes and that requiring the addition to maintain that south side yard setback would actually move the addition uh, further into the rear yard um, making a very narrow and awkward room space it also has the potential to eliminate the um, tree that's in the backyard that they hope to salvage staff um, supports the request and would indicate that approval of the variance is subject to the conditions as indicated on the staff report and with that I will stop and answer any questions you may have thank you Chris any questions for Chris Commissioner Platter Chris what's the lot width I guess I didn't see it in the plans anywhere do you know um, if I can read it on here um, and actually for the purposes of setback lot width is measured 50 feet back from the front lot line so uh, whatever is at the street frontage actually isn't what we would necessarily consider the lot width and I can't read it um, off of that it is obviously at least 75 feet in width um, because it would require the 10 foot setback. 10 foot so it's at least 75 yeah this lot is not untypical of the neighborhood. They um, all on the east side pretty much pie back and have a wider street frontage and narrower um, back lot line. So you said a lot width is taken 50 feet back. 50 on the lot. feet back from the lot. Okay. That's correct. Other questions? All right, hearing none, um, we'll move to open the public hearing. I would note, uh, as we're doing that, that we did receive some supplemental materials on our desks this <coughs> evening, um, letters of support from some neighbors at 6933 Cornelia, 6944 Hillcrest Lane, 6940 Hillcrest Lane, and 6932 Hillcrest Lane, and an email from uh, the Andersons at 6929 Cornelia Drive. So with that, uh, we'll open the public hearing and are the Sewards uh, in attendance? Yeah. Would, you like, would you like to come up and sure. add anything that you'd like to um, Ms. Zocker's report? Just come on up and introduce yourself. The side ones work better unless you've got something to show on the... You know, actually everything in the slide is what we need the survey so we can... Sure. Um, so we're the homeowners. I'm Ted Seward. This is Julie Seward, my wife. Welcome. And uh, yeah, thank you. So we've been at um, this house for about seven years, and since we've been there, our, our um, family's grown a bit, and so we're looking to grow our house a bit. Um, so on the survey, um, the part that we're adding on to really is adding on to the single real livable space beyond kitchen, bedrooms, bathroom. So we have a long rectangular living room that has a dining room at the end of it. And so we're looking to add on to the dining room and to add a real family room to it. So adding some space for a family. Um, so the, I think Chris did a great job. There's three things I, you know, I'll touch on briefly, and that's the practical difficulty, the character of the home, um, and the impact to our adjacent neighbors to the south, which I think is important to talk about. Um, as Chris pointed out, on the south side, really they have all unlivable space. They have a garage and they fall by a deck. When they're in their home, they can't see the remodel. So it's not until they step out into the deck and kind of look back to their side, to the back, that they would see that. So we sat down with them, um, showed them the survey, showed them the, the plans. Um, we're good friends with them. They're very excited for the remodel. They really don't have any problems with it and signed the letter of support. Um, the one thing that they were happy to see is that we weren't extending the remodel further back in the yard, such that it jeopardized the tree and block their view when they're sitting on their deck. So when they sit on their deck, when they look back to the yard, they're not going to really see the remodel. So um, they don't have any problems with it being adjacent to the house. Um, and so the neighbors to the north, south, the two to the east, one in the west, across the street, all signed letters of support. Um, I sat down with all of them, went through the details um, of the remodel. Um, the second thing with the character of the house, you know, really we're keeping to the Rambler style. Um, it's a single story. Um, as Chris pointed out in the north side, it's a 6.8 foot setback. We're going to do about a 6.6. .6. Pretty common throughout the neighborhood to see that. 
Um, and when you look straight on the house, it's going to look the same as it does today. It's not to get to the side and the rear that there's any difference. Um, the other thing I say with the character is we really want to preserve that tree. Um, we've worked with an arborist to, you know, show them our plans and, and determine that this is going to, you know, be good for the tree. It's not going to destroy it. And he believes that's the case. You know, there's no guarantee, but um, believes that it is a, a, you know, reasonable remodel to do. Um, we've written clauses into our contract based upon the suggestions to help preserve that tree. So we view that as a central character to our yard and to uh, the neighborhood as a whole, these nice trees. This one's about 60 years old, um, so we'd like to preserve it. And the last thing I'd say is with a practical difficulty, um, you know, for us, in, in addition to the, what Chris pointed out, is, you know, that narrower space, if we were to bring it in, we're going to lose a critical workspace that I'd like to use during the day of the work. Um, so they have the opportunity to work from home every now and then. Um, we also have a bench seating area that we'd like to keep. And by making it narrower, it doesn't mean you can necessarily recreate those features. And so um, we really feel that, you know, in our neighbor's field, this is the best way to pull it off and preserve the tree um, and, and add the remodel. So I don't know if anything that great. <laughs> so anyway, if you have any questions, I'll be happy yeah, to Yeah, any questions for the Sewards? Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, any members of the public who would like to comment on this application? Seeing none, I take a motion to close the public hearing. So moved. And a second? Second. <coughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, the public hearing is closed and we'll bring the discussion back to the commission. Mr. Chair. Commissioner <laughs> <laughs> Grable. Thank you. Uh, one point, I, a point I'd like to make, uh, the applicant has mentioned the favorable uh, responses from the neighborhood. It's nice that the neighbors in these kinds of cases agree with the, uh, uh, with the proposed plan. However, uh, yay or nay, the opinions of the neighbors are not really determinative of what we do as a commission here, but it's nice to hear that. Uh, secondly, uh, I am somewhat familiar with these homes in this block. Uh, I've been in some of them. They're smallish. This is a nice opportunity to add some space. What is particularly impressive, I think, in this proposal is that from the street, the streetscape will be I uh, virtually identical to what it is now. Uh, there will be no uh, particular impact from the streetscape. Uh, along the side yard, uh, again, uh, virtually no impact to the affected neighborhood uh, and they are taking uh, really good efforts to maintain the tree and the, the, uh, the canopy uh, in the neighborhood. So, you know, in terms of the kinds of things that uh, Commissioner Platter and the, uh, the subcommittee were working on, what do we do about remodels and uh, teardowns and all of that type of thing, Given what they might have been able to do or wanted to do with this lot, I think this is an, a fine example of a really sensitive uh, and effective uh, remodel request, and I would s seriously support this uh, initiative. Other comments? Commissioner Platter. Thanks for looking out for the trees. It's become a topic of interest. Well, perhaps, Commissioner Grable, you'd like to convert your uh, statement to a motion? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would move approval of the request subject to the findings and conditions in the staff report. Is there a second? It's been moved and seconded to approve the variance application. Is there further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Congratulations. All right, next up is another variance at um, 6717 Rosemary Lane in Edina, uh, Jeffrey Einhorn. Chris, you're going to lead us through this? I am. Thank you. Jeff and Christy Einhorn, I guess. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the Planning Commission. There are two variances required. 
for this proposal. They are front yard setback variances for 6717 Rosemary Lane. The subject property is a corner lot. It fronts Rosemary Lane with the side street along Valley View Road. However, there are homes fronting Valley View Road. So this is a property that is required to maintain two front yard setbacks. It's the corner lot right here. Uh, what you'll notice is that the adjacent home to the east fronts Valley View, and then there's a home to the north that fronts Rosemary Lane. And then across Valley View is St. Patrick's Church. This is a view of the front of the home as it exists today. Uh, what they're proposing to do is add a mudroom uh, adjacent to the existing garage. It'll actually be recessed from the front wall of the garage and then also add an additional garage stall, which will be slightly recessed away from the front face of the garage. This is the property that is adjacent to the east that's fronting Valley View and the home that is to the north at 6713 Rosemary Lane. This is a property directly across the south, which is St. Patrick's Church. They have a parking lot or, and their front door uh, facing the side of the subject property. This is a um, survey of the subject property. What's highlighted in green are the areas of improvement. It does require a variance, and this is why. The area that I've boxed out in gray is the buildable area of the lot. So there's very little area that um, can be added onto in terms of uh, the existing home. Most of it is not conforming forward of that um, setback box and then also to the south. So any of, the, any of these um, additions would do require a variance. The ordinance does allow 200 square feet uh, within a, an area that has a non-conforming setback. However, uh, both additions exceed that. They're 375 square feet, and um, they are going beyond the existing non-conforming setback along the south wall. What they're proposing to do is reduce that non-conforming setback that's currently here now um, in the area of the garage, and they'd be 22.2 feet away from uh, Valley View Road, and then also have the small addition of a mudroom, which actually will be further away than the front wall of the garage from Rosemary Lane. But as you can see, uh, they both do still require a variance. A typical side street setback of this home um, that's adjacent to the east were not facing Valley View Road would be 15 feet for the side wall of the garage, and they're proposing 22.2 feet, so clearly they're much further back than what would be required for a typical side street. The spacing between the back wall of the garage and the adjacent neighbor to the east is well over 75 feet, and it would be the same for the home to the north. And in fact, I don't think they would be affected at all by the small addition um, to the north of the garage for the mudroom. The most affected uh, property would be probably the property to the south because uh, the garage addition extending closer to the street, and that is St. Patrick's Church. Uh, this is the existing basement plan, the existing elevations of the house, uh, very similar to the photo that you saw. Uh, this then is what they're proposing in terms of the addition, the small mudroom addition on the main floor, and then an additional garage stall. And the view from Rosemary Lane won't change dramatically. You'll have the small mudroom addition, and then the additional garage stall. Um, from an elevation perspective, uh, from the south, rear, and north, again, um, not much of a change with the exception of an additional garage stall. Back in, I believe it was the early, mid-60s, uh, this property was actually subdivided off from the property to the north and it um, required a lot depth variance. So um, what you see is that the lot depth is 110 feet. It required a variance because our current requirement is 120 feet. It also stated in um, that variance that they wanted to have the house front Rosemary Lane. So typically you would have the narrower the street frontage as the front, um, but they wanted to orient the house towards Rosemary Lane. 
This then forces a very shallow backyard. You can see the limited building opportunity that was created given the lot, given the lot and how it was subdivided. Um, it is shallower than most of the lots. And as a result of how it was subdivided, how the home was oriented, um, you can see that from at least three sides, the house is currently non-conforming in terms of setback. So, um, is the proposed development reasonable for the site? Staff does believe the proposal is reasonable. It will meet all of the other R1 requirements. The homeowners are trying to maintain the integrity and character of the Rambler. They have no intention of um, adding a second floor. Uh, they merely want to add on to um, the existing Rambler and um, add additional space for a garage and a mudroom. They have uh, three boys and lots of stuff, so they do need the extra storage space. Staff would recommend approval um, given the difficulty with which um, there's any opportunity to add on to the property. Uh, staff would subject, the, subject any approval to the following conditions. Uh, the survey date stamped December 27, 2012, and the building plans and elevations as submitted uh, with this application. There were also um, letters of the neighbors that were set out in front of you. All of the surrounding neighbors have signed off on it. The only neighbor we haven't heard from um, is St. Patrick's Church. And with that, I will stop and answer any questions you may have. Any questions for Chris? Commissioner Shearer. Um, I, maybe I missed it on any of the drawings. I, I wasn't able to identify. With regard to the addition of the garage, are we going to have a rounded piece of concrete that attaches to the other concrete or asphalt? Or are we just going to add another strip of covering out from that garage? What, what is, what's going oh, to happen to the driveway? connecting all the way down to the street. Um, they would have to get a new curb cut approved through the engineering department, and there are maximum width requirements. Right. Um, I Just looking at the drawing, they're probably at that right now, so I would suspect they probably just, and that's what you typically do instead of um, eating up your yard right. with that much pavement. You usually just have. But, um, but we a, don't know exactly what their plan is. I don't. Okay. Commissioner Platter. Chris, can you, I can't quite tell the plans are so small, but it looks like they're actually setting back the garage a couple feet or the addition from the other one. Is that the yes. case? Yes, 1.3 feet. It'll be 1.3? Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions for Chris? All right, hearing Chris, none. Oh, you got excuse me. If, if, this, if this was a proposal, if this property fronted on Valley View, and the applicant wanted to extend out to the front of the yard set back by that much, what would the staff's position be? Do you understand what I'm saying? I absolutely understand what you're saying. Well, I guess it would depend upon the plan and the conditions that um, were surrounding it. My opinion on this really boils down to the fact that it is functioning as a side street as opposed to a front street relative to the home to the east. But you're right, if it were, if it were the front of the house and it was lined up with the adjacent ones, it, it actually is already non-conforming on that side, which is unfortunate because of how it was subdivided and how the home was originally placed. So I don't know. Thank you, Chris. We'll uh, open the public hearing. And uh, are the Einhorns here? Would you like to come up and supplement Chris's report? Sure. Welcome. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Um, I'm Christy Einhorn, and this is my husband, Jeff Einhorn. Um, our family's resided at 6717 Rosemary Lane for over eight years. Our family has grown significantly since we moved in eight years ago. We now have actually four active and growing boys, um, Aiden, who's nine, Lance is six, and we have identical twins, so it was three pregnancies with four boys. So identical twin boys that are two, Wyatt and Tristan. Um, we love our community. And we're really fortunate that our location makes it possible for our family to be active in both our neighborhood schools and our church, all within walking distance from our home. 
It's important to us that the design maintains the structure of our home, aligns with the look and feel of the neighborhood, and also provides adequate vehicle storage for our family. We believe in good environmental stewardship, and with our growing family and our love for our neighborhood, our preferred option is to work with our existing home. So in terms of the driveway, we didn't have any plans, but we would do the minimum, so I think it would be the rounded. We're not looking for a ton of asphalt. No. Any other questions for the Einhorns? Thank you. Thanks. Is there anyone else in the audience who would like to comment on this application? Seeing none, I'd take a motion for closing the public hearing. So moved. And a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, so the public hearing is closed. Comments from the commission? Commissioner Grable. No? Crickets. Need the cricket sounder. Commissioner Grable. Uh, I have I have uh, no issue at all with the grant you request for the Monday edition. Um, from, from the streetscape, uh, there's, there's no impact virtually to the streetscape by the addition of that mudroom. It lines up with the balance of the house. I have a I have an issue with the addition of the third stall of the garage. The city of Edina requires a two-car two garage. Uh, I question whether there's uh, a practical difficulty. Do they need to have, is, is there some reason we should grant a variance so somebody can have a third stall in a garage? I, that does not seem to me to fit the criteria for granting variances, especially since uh, this side yard acts like a front yard setback. And going east from this house, uh, that's going to stick out like uh, a sore thumb uh, and create a visual impact that I think is not particularly favorable. So uh, I could support the one variance, but really not the other. Other comments? Chris, do you know... Um, what the lot coverage is with the additions? Twenty four point one seven feet. So just slightly under twenty five percent. And this lot is twenty five percent the limit? Correct. Okay. So they couldn't put much more than this on in any event? No. Okay. Um, Commissioner Grable, if this space were um, living space on the Valley View side of the house, would you feel differently about it? Uh, I, I might a little bit, but still the fact is going east, you've got the line of homes in the setback as, it, as you come down Valley View, and this all of a sudden juts out. And, uh, you know, the setbacks are there for a purpose. Uh, and part of the purpose is what what does the con is the neighborhood consistent and uh, this creates a glaring inconsistency I think Commissioner Platter I have a question for the applicant I guess in that case what uh, are there plans to re landscape that side to soften that edge of that garage or what do you have any plans with you or anything that would it looks like I can't really tell what's there right now but um, yeah, we would, should, it, would it truly be that sticking out or would there be a lot of landscaping to soften that? We, so. cur we currently have a lot of landscaping there, including a six-foot fence that um, runs between our house and the house, um, the, Valley View, the houses that face Valley View. Um, from their driveway, from the very end of their driveway, you can't see into our yard because of the fence and the landscaping. We have two large trees. We have a very large oak tree that is on the... Um, corner of our lot as well as a, um, a very large pine tree are you planning additional as you as you put that garage in to screen that some more or does your fence your fence partially screens it then too between the fence and the tree the that evergreen tree you you can't 
you can't even see into our, even if we didn't have the fence there, you wouldn't be able to see even the, you can't see the garage even from that, from the Valley View side. We, we can certainly do that. So the fence is on the east side. So as you come down Valley View from the east, you can't really see much of the house. From the north side, you would maybe notice um, a little bit, but you know, it's, I guess there's a tree there and stuff. So. And we would definitely need to do some landscaping anyways. We have a dry creek bed that runs along the side of that house, the, along the side of the house and along the garage there. On the south side, so we'd redo that. For sure, but there. if there was, yeah, if we, if we needed to do anything else, we would, but at this point you can't, you can't see even from the end of their driveway. Yeah, 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 I know. Yeah. Well, well we, Mr. we do, but the fence runs parallel to the front of the adjacent house. Yeah, it's, it's not, not it's, it's not coming down it's the driveway. South. It's right. it's parallel. Okay. Right, it's east. Yeah. <clears throat> Other comments. You know, um, I think that Commissioner Grable's points are well taken. Um, the, the observations I'd make about this property that are that, that make me um, more receptive to the variance are one, it's, it's this corner lot notion. I mean that does create um, setbacks that you don't have in other places. Um, and secondly, I do think the fact that it's Valley View and that the neighbor directly across the street is more of an institutional use. And other than, I want to think from Rosemary, is there another, you know, if you're, if you're going up the street toward Gleason, this is a corner house, so you're going across the street, and that house faces Rosemary Lane, is that right? The house directly across Rosemary from you? Yes. yes. Okay, so it doesn't front on Valley View. So I guess I'm, I'm um, I guess there's two houses to your east that front on Valley View. And then is it the high school entrance? Um, there's, where? We're the, there's four houses. Along four the houses back until back the high school back. entrance. And then there's the high school. Other comments? Commissioner Scherer. Um, I'm... Also, um, have noted that the items that you mentioned, plus another one, that it's such an unusual situation. If you look at the houses that are going down Rosemary, um, you know this house is not nearly as as long now. I mean, in, in terms of the ability that was obviously made to hold it back from Valley View originally, uh, and there aren't there are so few opportunities for any kind of change uh, on the house. I'm, I'm additionally respectful of the fact that. Uh, the neighborhood character and appearance is, is being maintained, especially if we look at the houses as they go down Rosemary in terms of the addition. I, I would add, this has nothing to do with code, but I, I, I live in not too far from this neighborhood and I'm, I'm personally in favor <laughs> of three stalls on garages and allowing a lot of the material and, and later cars that your four boys are gonna have uh, to be you know tucked behind garage doors and not sitting out on uh, side slabs of cement, which people have started to do in some areas of the neighborhood. Um, so I find the garage actually more attractive than that other alternative. Good thing you don't drive by my house. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm just through with, with that. only three boys. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I'm uh, leaning in favor of uh, both of the requested variances. Further comments? Question. Commissioner Forrest. So it's about. 50 feet then between what would be the back of the garage and the neighbor to the east. Is that about right, Chris? I think you thought it was 75. About 75 feet. Yeah. From the back of the new garage? Yes. Oh, I got my scale on there. Okay. I'm looking down here. I mean, I, I agree with Commissioner Grable's um, Understanding as far as hardship goes, and the fact that a it's for a garage and b it uh, it doesn't uh, yeah I, I agree with his rationale on there. However, based upon the neighborhood and the neighborhood support and the distance from the pro you know proximity from the house to the east, I'm leaning in favor of it as well. 
Commissioner Potts. A question for the applicant. Um, you mentioned the oak tree on the corner. What steps have you taken to protect that, or have you thought about that, or are you taking it down? Oh, we're not taking it down. We wouldn't take it down. I think the, the neighborhood, we would be upset, and the neighborhood would be, would be upset as well. Um, it's a pretty monumental tree. Um, when we... Um, Ms. Ms. Einhorn, can I ask you to come up just so that anybody watching can't hear you from oh, there, sorry. unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Um, we, we love that tree. We love the canopy of the tree. It's a landmark in the neighborhood. Um, we often get comments from the neighbors about how they love that tree, and we love raking those leaves every year, <laughs> 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 too. But um, we, we did talk with um, Ron Sonic, who's um, our designer, and we asked that we make sure that that tree is preserved. And um, he said that he would work with an arborist. He has an arborist that he works with. Um, we, we like that tree too, so okay. it's, a, it's a very old tree. So Thank you. Maintain that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Further discussion? Anyone care Mr. to make Chair, a motion? I'd only Mr. point Grable. out that there are seven lots there that are, that are covered by that setback requirement along Valley View. Uh, not just so between not just the ones on the east side of Rosemary. Between the ones on the west side of Rosemary as well. So on, are you talking about that front on Valley View? Yes. So from Gleason to, to yeah. Okay, so that last, so 6760 is the one that's adjacent to the high school driveway. So this is one of seven lots. Yes. And 6721, is that Gleason? Does that one front on Valley View? That one fronts on Valley View. And 6732 fronts on Rosemary. But then all the rest, well, 6717 fronts on Rosemary, and then the four to the east of 6717 all front on Valley View. Okay. Commissioner Forrest. Just one more clarification. The, um the buildable area that was computed for the for the lot was that based somewhat on the on the front yard setbacks of the adjacent homes on Valley View. How was that determined uh, as far as that south edge of it, the buildable it area? It was determined by the setback of the home to the east on Valley View. Oh, the envelope that you had drawn on that one slide. Okay, so that's the double front setback basically mm -hmm. that creates that's correct. that. Okay. Further discussion? I'd entertain a motion. Commissioner Scherer. I would move that we entertain the, uh, that we approve the variances as uh, identified in the staff report and uh, subject to all the staff's observations and conditions. Second. Further discussion? Commissioner Grable. No. no. Hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. The motion passes. Congratulations. All right. The next item is a subdivision for Miriam Kaiser at 5633 Tracy Avenue in Edina. Carrie, take it away. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Members of the Commission, this property is located uh, just south of Vernon on Tracy Avenue. It is an oversized lot compared to the neighborhood. This, this property is over 36,000 square feet in size, so pretty good sized lot. Uh, there is an existing single family home. This is a summertime conditions uh, look at the home, uh, Rambler style winter conditions. The applicant is proposed, you can see it sits uh, pretty much in the middle of the, the property. The applicant is proposing to split this lot into two lots, um, sell the property, and then would be developed with two new single family homes. So the request before the commission is this, a subdivision preliminary plat to create the two new lots and lot width variances from 85 feet to 80 feet. Uh, for each lot. So the uh, lot area and lot depth 
are met with this proposal. It's just the lot width that doesn't quite hit that medium or the median uh, at 85 feet. So the primary issue before the Planning Commission is are those variance findings met? Uh, staff believes that they are. Uh, practical difficulty in this instance is the size of the lot. As you see, it is double the size of, of all of the lots on this block. In, partic in particular, the lot to the east, um, if, it, if not for the subdivision, would be the same size. So again, this, it's twice the size of all the lots uh, on this, this block. Subdivision of this property would result in two lots that are more characteristic of the neighborhood, the 80-foot wide lots. The reason that the 85-foot median comes into play is these lots to the south here are all 85 feet or over for the most part. So that's where the 85 um, is coming in in this case. Most of the lots here on Tracy and on Johnson here to the east, these are all 80-foot wide lots. <clears throat> the proposal would not alter the character of the neighborhood. Again, two 80-foot wide lots are, uh, would be in character. Utilities have already been stubbed to the property um, in the assumption that, these, that this property would be subdivided today. And um, lastly, the 80-foot the, uh, the wide lots exceed our minimum standard of 75 feet. Um, that's the minimum required in Edina. So this, this request isn't similar to the lot widths that we've been struggling with with the variances for 50-foot wide lots. We've got a proposal here for two lots that exceed the 75 feet in width. So with that, staff is recommending approval of the subdivision subject to the findings and conditions that are outlined in the staff report. Carrie, because we have been focusing a lot on, on lot width, um, can you remind us what the rationale is for, I, I thought our lot width was 75. How does it get increased to more than that? Yeah, it's, it's our minimum standards are 75 feet of width, 125 feet of depth, and 9,000 square feet in area. But in neighborhoods where the lots exceed those, those three standards, it becomes the median. Um, so it's the median of all properties within 500 feet for lot area, depth, and width. So the applicant ran the median calculations, and the, uh, the lots all exceed the median average, which is... <clears throat> So the median required lot size is 12,090 square feet. Both of these lots exceed 18,000 square feet, so they're well above the median for median lot area. Lot area, but the, the median front lot width is? Is 85, and again, it's, it really comes into play because of those lots to the south that I had pointed out. Those are all 85 feet in width. And it's not, the, it's not the average, it's the median. It's the median, right. So an equal number of greater size and an equal number of square. Right. Size. Okay. Other questions? Commissioner Scheer. Uh, just quickly looking at the drawings that you have shown us, is my understanding, I'd like to know if it's correct, if, if this is accomplished, these are essentially the same size as the two lots that they would abut to the east? They would be identical to the two lots to the east. Okay, correct. thank you. Other questions for Kerry? Commissioner Grable. Uh, Carrie, what's, I'm looking at this exhibit that shows the building pads. And that, wh what is the required side yard setback yeah, on the, these lots? That seems to be me to be very, a very yeah, the, large building pad. Those this. examples don't meet our setback requirements. It's 10 feet. 10 so feet. You, you're, you wouldn't be approving any building pads here. Any any uh, development on those properties would have to meet all of our minimum standards. Okay. So they would be held to that 10-foot setback. All right. Further questions for Carrie? Seeing none, or Floyd, do you have another one? No. Good, okay. Um, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> gotta be careful with that. All right, so we'll open the public hearing. Uh, are the applicants present? Would you like to come on up, introduce yourselves? And Hi, uh, my name is Rod Helm. I'm an agent with CB Burnett Realty. I'm acting as the applicant today. I'm uh, also the listing agent for Miriam Kaiser, who is the owner. I don't know if you want to introduce yourself. Yeah. 
I have lived in Edina at that property for 60 years, and I appreciate any, any uh, advice and <laughs> vote you can give. Uh, uh, isn't welcome, Ms. Kaiser. Pardon? Welcome. Thank you. It's uh, interesting you brought up the uh, two lots to the east because that originally was all one site uh, that, that Miriam and her husband owned. So it was a four-parcel site that those were subdivided, I believe, in the late 60s, and those are identical sites to the east that, that we're proposing. Um, just a couple notes. I think Carrie uh, did a great job at presenting it. Uh, as far as neighborhood reaction, I've only received a couple calls with questions on it since we did the posting and also the mailing uh, into the the 500 foot uh, perimeter neighborhood. One was just the, the neighbor to the rear, which has known this was going on. It just had a, a very brief question about a borderline, and the other just was inquiring on what we're doing. Um, I personally have not received any pushback at all from any neighbors. Uh, this property is on the market for some time with the idea that this was a potential subdivision, uh, and again through the process have not received any uh, pushback at all. Um, I included uh, in your packet kind of a look at the data that our surveyor put together. And uh, I want to just make a couple comments because it just, there's a lot of, t what's hanging us up is a st statistical uh, issue with the median. And there's 77 properties in this data set that we're looking at that surround the fi 500 foot radius of this. You know, of those 77 properties, 21 of those have lot widths between 80 and 81 feet. Uh, this one is going to be 80.64 feet uh, each one, so very much in line with a, a, a large percentage of those properties. Um, also, just on a percentage level, the pr proposed site on, from an area level is 155% of that median. On a, on a depth, it's 171% of the median. So there still are very large sites being subdivided into. Um, I did a, a specific sampling set of the properties on Tracy, just to break the, the stat statistics down more because I, I recognize what Kerry did. What was hanging us up is actually the properties to the south where they switched from pulling four properties out of a part, basically the section parcels into six. So by getting more sites, they actually hurt us on this requirement. Um, but the Tracy properties, we do exceed the median. There were, I believe, 11 properties in that portion of the data set and that median was 80 feet. Um, See here. So the ones to the north are 80 feet. Yeah, the, basically the whole street's 80. Um, and again, as mentioned earlier, those two parcels directly to the east are identical sites to what's being proposed. When was that subdivided? I think it was about 1963. Oh, my. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you know Frank Carterell. Oh, sure. Well, he is. He, he did the survey on that, too. He divided the lots for <laughs> <us>. <laughs> and, uh, Okay. So. That would have been before, our, well, before the code, before the 75 foot, or before the median requirement. Oh, the median requirement. I think it would have been before the median requirement. So that's why there it wasn't a variance necessary. But right. The code was adopted before that, so right. it would have been a 75 foot requirement back then, and then. It well, we bought lot five acre, lot five warden acres, and okay. it turned out to be this two acre lot. And, uh, you know, we weren't smart about those things in those days. And <laughs> Edina was barely here. Yeah, right. This was, <laughs> this was in, you were out in the country. 1951, we built the house. Okay. And uh, so lots of changes. We, um, you know, Tracy does receive state subsidies. So we have um, uh, got approval from the state as well. They, their planning department okayed this uh, subdivision. And then also speaking to the spirit of it, Carrie mentioned this. Well, Tracy was being resurfaced. We had talked to the engineering crews there. Um, they were uh, concerned of, of a subdivision going through later and tearing up their roads. So the, the actual water and sewer has been stubbed into the new site. And uh, new water has been stubbed, or new water lines actually have been increased into the existing property. So, you know, going with the spirit of it, I think some of the initial looks at everything was that these were going to line up just fine. It's when we hit this... Uh, and again, how the, the widths are determined, you know, you bring it in the pie and all of a sudden we miss by a couple data points. Okay. Any further questions for the applicant? Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other members of the public who'd like to speak on this issue? Seeing none, I'd take a motion to close the public hearing. 
All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. All right, so discussion. Commissioner Forrest. Here comes another nit, but I don't see having a lot that is too big, as when you say the practical difficulty is due to the fact that the property is double the size of all the lots. I don't see that as a difficulty. Uh, you can still build a single family home on a lot that's too big. I would say that the practical difficulty is more because the numbers get skewed by the surrounding properties, the, the medians get skewed even though the lot is, um, exceeds significantly the area and uh, um, the lot area and the depth. So I, I think it's more the, um, the fact that the surrounding properties skew the required, you know, the median requirement for the um, lot width, not that the lot's too big. Other comments? Commissioner Forrest. I move approval of the um, request here, subject to the staff report and conditions. Is there a second? Second. Further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, same sign. Congratulations, your variance has been approved. Or actually, this one's a recommendation of the council. Okay, so you'll be in front of the city council at Staff will be able to tell you which meeting they'll take it up on, but when subdivisions, we make recommendations to the city council and they'll make the final decision. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, that concludes our public hearings, and next on the agenda is reports and recommendations and a zoning ordinance update from our residential redevelopment subcommittee. Uh, Mike, did you want to present this or? Okay, great. So I don't care if you could bring that up. While we're doing that, can somebody remind me when, when we did, when we appointed you all to uh, take on this task? Was it the was, beginning uh, of December? It was the. the Beginning of November, beginning of November. or late late October, one of those okay. one of those meetings. They've moved with great dispatch. It's amazing, actually. So we're back. All right, take it away, Commissioner Flatter. So this is an update. We were here, I believe, it was the f January 9th meeting. We had some initial comments to everyone on what we were, our plan was and what we we're going to do. And now we're here to report back on basically what we've done, and then anything else going forward. So our, our goals were we we're going to review the current residential rebuild situation, create public input forums, evaluate these results, and ultimately provide recommendations to your, the planning commission yourselves and also the city council. So a little bit of history. I won't go into too deep on this, but this, some of these issues came up in 2007, 2008. Some things were done, such as uh, putting a maximum building height restriction, uh, this is where the maximum grade lift came in to be one foot. Um, set bay window side back or setback exception. Uh, limiting residential FAR was discussed, but no action was taken at that time. So just a, a graphic of where we're at. So uh, we're uh, everything we've we've done to date on here. We've uh, blog on Speak Up Edina. We had the initial presentation to you on the ninth. We've had a couple public input forums. Uh, the notes for those forums are actually in your packet. So if you look back in your packet, it's in the appendix, all the, all the notes from that that Jackie had taken. A lot of notes there. Uh, right here, we're on February 13th to uh, report out. And then uh, the next steps, uh, if, if, a, if a recommended from, from the rest of the Planning Commission, would either to uh, bring this back. We have another meeting, Planning Commission meeting. I forget the exact date, but it's one before. Uh, March 5th when we would uh, plan on taking this to City Council and the work session at that point to get some feedback from them. After that, it's kind of TBD, depending on what their pleasure may be as to what to go forth with. So just in here, I wanted to 
point out the current zoning comparisons. We took a lot of the existing and surrounding areas just to point out where we're at. Um, part of the things that we came up in our public forums is that uh, people really believe Edina had no limitations on buildings and we wanted to point out that it actually does. And for the most part, they are more restrictive or at least as restrictive as the surrounding communities. So our, kind of our themes to date was uh, on new and remodeled home sizes and lot modifications. Under that, the most concerns were on city lots, of, or smaller city lots, so less than 75 feet, 9,000 square feet. We didn't hear a whole lot on, on larger lots, and it was mainly around 50-foot lots in that range on redevelopment. We heard about massing, height, grading and drainage, and reduction of the tree canopy. Another big theme we heard was on the... Uh, uh, actual, the actual construction, the site debris, the work hours, the noise, the parking. Uh, the city has put forth a construction management plan to date, but we believe, and we'll show this in a little bit, that it probably needs some enhancements from where it is today. It's a great first step, but it, I think it's something, or we think it's something that can be improved upon. So when we approach this, you know, this issue or these issues, there's not a single solution. These are very complicated issues. It affects a lot of people. One of the things we're asking is, you know, how do individual property rights and community rights intersect? Where, where does the individual, what they can do to their, their property intersect with drainage for everyone, with, with trees for everyone? How does that impact the rest of the community? Uh, one person's dream can become another person's nightmare, particularly if now you have water drainage into somebody else's basement right next to it. We also don't want to create more issues than are solved. We don't want to get to the point where everything's a variance either. So we don't want to have everything coming back in here for approval. We also need to look at how does changes compare with surrounding communities and uh, you know also as a city we need to keep our policies and ordinance adapting to contemporary needs as things change. So uh, with that uh, Arlene will will have some other comments here. Yeah, just okay. Um, as Commissioner Platter said um, not all of the topics that we discussed are directly related to teardowns, but that was certainly an instigation for this, um, this subcommittee. The teardown trend isn't new or unique to Edina. In the late 90s and early 2000s, this became an increasingly troublesome issue for a lot of communities around the country. Uh, some of it was centered on the East Coast, um, for example, Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, Western Connecticut, or Westport, Connecticut, rather, and. Uh, Palo Alto in California, but a, and a lot around uh, the Chicago area in the communities there. The typical teardowns in Edina, uh, the factors that play into it are similar to what's um, happened around the country, but in our city it's focused a lot on parts of town where there are smaller lots because of the economics involved, and that tends to be the northeast quadrant and some in the northwest quadrant. There, it's housing stock that was built often in the early 20th century, before the 1950s or, or shortly around thereafter. And there are neighborhoods that are established and tend to have mature trees and, and sidewalks. Um, we have one zoning code in Edina and there are some variances, some differences. I better not use that word variance. There are differences regarding uh, lot size and some of the factors, such as the percentage of um, uh, buildable area that we can allow. So we've used one particular approach to try to structure our building, the homes that are built in our community, so that they fit well with one another. As the as other towns have dealt with this issue, they've um, used some other tools. Design review is one that's been used in other places. I think that would rather be rather difficult here, but however, it was one thing that was brought up more than once at our public forums. And I think it should be discussed as in whether or not it, it's even feasible. Um, I think among our subcommittee, we don't see it as certainly not, wouldn't be an easy thing to implement. Uh, new zoning and over, overlay districts are a possibility. Uh, in that maybe we have more than just an R1. We might have an R1A or an R2. Or we might have an overlay district that applies only to those houses that are on lots of a certain size that don't meet, meet a um, particular size requirement. Some other communities use incentives for building uh, reuse. They have 
um, incentives if people build specific desired attribute, attributes such as uh, backyard garages or uh, open porches and things like that. Then as you loosen things up a little bit, um, there might be construction guidelines to identify design characteristics that are typical of a neighborhood so that somebody who's building there can uh, make their selections based upon those guidelines so that their, um, the new home is more compatible. And then written neighborhood character guidelines for new neighbors and builders. Sometimes those character, um, when you talk about a neighborhood character, that's something that's okay, it's in the Minnesota statutes when we are discussing variances and, you know, as we've said before, and it's also in our comp plan. But there really isn't any truly objective definition and there probably shouldn't be because each neighborhood varies so much, but it makes it really difficult for somebody to say, this is appropriate and this isn't appropriate. In some um, municipalities, they have descriptions of what constitutes the, neighbor, the, the character of a neighborhood in a particular zoning district, such as um, there will be sidewalks, there will be however many stories, there will be particular location of garages and things like that. So, but it, it keeps coming up in discussion. Um, we want things to fit into the neighborhood. It doesn't fit into the neighborhood. Uh, this works, this doesn't work. And it gets difficult, we admit, that to try and identify what really works. So now because these smaller, in quotes, uh, lots are the ones that seem to be more targeted for teardowns, uh, we need to decide, and, and I think more overtly decide, what we really want as a community. Our options are to maintain what we have now, keep, keep the zoning the way it is, but this apparently, at least according to the community feedback, isn't really addressing the reality of what's happening, that homes that are often significantly larger, considering that homes built now are on average about twice what they were in the 1950s, um, it doesn't really address what's going in on lots and how it, they relate to the uh, homes around them. We could establish new lot size requirements. So we could say, okay, we are no longer going to require a 75-foot lot um, and the 9,000 square feet. They, we can just say, smaller's fine. There are 40-foot lots in town. Um, there's so much diversity in our lot size and shape, as we saw tonight. Corner lots face their own challenges that... Um, Maybe, you know, this one approach would be to say, okay, small lots, fine, and then perhaps address the impact of the bulk of a new um, home on those lots in other ways. And then we can maintain our current lot size standards, but allow, as we've discussed before, subdivisions into of um, non-conforming building lots if it was previously platted that way um, on the city plats. So. We have some choices to make, but I think it's better that we make those choices so that the community knows what to expect than to just um, try to get around everything with variances. Thanks, Arlene. Uh, so when this single uh, zoning ordinance that, that we live under was created 30 to, to 40 years ago and established those 75 minimum size lots. Uh, we've already seen today that that's created some confusion and seems to um, favor larger lots and we just dealt with um, subdividing into two 80-foot lots um, being a, a variance of uh, establishing lots below what this uh, median was. So when that when that zoning ordinance was written uh, very much it was written very much for the larger lots that were being developed uh, on, in the western part of the city and the idea of teardowns on the existing non-conforming lots below 75 feet in width um, didn't seem to be uh, considered. The, the teardown rebuild just wasn't happening. And I think the one way to characterize the pressure that uh, has been created is the, uh, the idea that you can build a home the size of what uh, is is easy to build on a large lot and try and fit it onto one of these smaller lots. And in fact, um, that's a, a lot of what we heard from the public input sessions 
uh, people who are, are um, living on the same streets or adjacent uh, to these homes being built that really max out uh, what we allow on a lot, which is uh, shown in this diagram here in the, the description of the buildable area. If you max that out on a lot below 75 feet in width, you can start to really um, uh, have an effect on your neighbor in, in uh, several different ways. So a lot of the public input that we gathered that we'll start to go through now has to do with uh, figuring out ways to, to manage that, that pressure and start to um, deal with the buildable area in a way to um, try and find that right line, uh, which, which is uh, certainly a challenge between uh, what allows somebody to build uh, the type of house they want um, and still uh, coexist well with their neighbors in the neighborhood and also deal with that um, tricky nature of, of what is a neighborhood character, which in, in some respects you could make a case does deal with the size of a house on a given size of a lot. And in fact, we've seen a couple of um, Rambler uh, uh, neighborhood variances come through just tonight that uh, do a, a good job of making that point, I think. So some of the things I'll, I'll run through here are uh, the lot coverage ideas, um, how setbacks uh, deal with that, our uh, current height, uh, height um, 35 to 40 foot height limits that uh, Mike referred to. Uh, we'll also touch on uh, garage size and placement and uh, impermeable areas. So I'm gonna, gonna go through some of these things as they uh, deal with structures built on the sites and then Mike will get up and deal with some of the, the horizontal issues. Uh, you could uh, refer to them as on sites. So with the, uh, um, the, in particular, the side yard setbacks have been a challenging issue now. Uh, lots between 50 and, se and 75 feet in width have a, a varying setback requirement that goes between 5 and, and 10 feet that's in place. And uh, that in, com in combination with the uh, lot coverage allowable and uh, large heights can result in homes that well, the neighbors describe them as, as they feel too close together. And uh, this image is not from some homes in Edina, but does an interesting job of, of making that point where somebody still uh, snuck a driveway around back, but the idea of houses uh, very close to each other uh, is, one, is one that came up a lot. And so the alternative approaches that uh, folks suggested that we uh, thought were good ideas were to look at ways to increase the setback dimensions um, without having too much of an impact on the size of the house you can build on a lot. And in particular, uh, we took a look at uh, St. Louis Park and other cities that don't necessarily look at two equal side yard setbacks, uh, whereas currently we have that five, five feet on each side with a 50 foot lot. Um, but what they do is have a, um, a minimum of five feet and then allow you, and then um, have a, a, an all, on the other side of the house, um, in the case of St. Louis Park, seven feet of setback. So it starts to, to um, reduce the buildable area uh, slightly by increasing that uh, side yard setback. And that in combination with um, regulating the sidewall architecture, in other words, um, trying to avoid having a long, uninterrupted sidewall of a house are the uh, sorts of things that deal with that feeling of homes being uh, too large and too, uh, too close together. Uh, so by, by considering changing the side yard setbacks is also a way uh, to deal with other issues that have come up, and um, Mike will deal with these in, in a little more detail, but just to mention them, um, Having egress windows in the uh, side yards has been, been a, a big issue, in particular um, in cases where it blocks access from front yard to the backyard. Uh, stormwater drainage uh, is a, an issue that um, becomes more sensitive when you get two houses close, uh, close together. And again, um, the importance of being able to travel on your own property from the uh, front yard to the, the rear is something that we just haven't regulated uh, before, but seems like a, an important thing to do and a good part of this study. Uh, again, back to that uh, issue of height. On the larger lots, uh, not a big issue, but on the smaller lots where uh, particularly neighborhoods in transition now, um, 
people are feeling the pressure of having a very tall house built um, also very close to their um, to their smaller house uh, as as being disruption. Um, we think that that some of the good suggestions we heard are um, number one, there's some confusion in the way the height is measured on these homes. We've got a, a variable height of 35 to 40 feet and also a measurement taken to the, the midpoint of a roof uh, slope, which we think we can uh, simplify uh, with some minor changes in this. And uh, also reduce that height somewhat, again, uh, thinking about the, the homes close together on the narrower lots without uh, impacting someone's ability to build a story and a half or two story house. I certainly don't want to um, take that away. And uh, then another, another issue that we heard a lot from uh, neighborhood folks, again, was the, the idea of construction guidelines to, uh, to manage the height. And then the, the issue of garages um, is a, another sensitive point. Currently, uh, it's actually a requirement to build a two-car garage within, with any residence. And um, as communities seek to increase walkability uh, and community services and cut down on automobile trips uh, where people can, uh, to, be, uh, to have to build a two-car garage for a family that only owns one car, uh, it seems like an unusual uh, sort of requirement. Uh, where it impacts the character of the neighborhoods is when uh, garages become the dominant element of the house, uh, like in this picture here. So the, the feedback we heard that we um, support is the idea of allowing uh, single car garages, which has the added impact of making it um, easier to build a house on a narrower lot, still have a front car garage, but not have it be the, um, the dominant element, which can um, eliminate the idea of a porch or, or the uh, walkability of the street in front of that house. Uh, other suggestions that came up were um, managing how much of a front facade can be taken up by a garage. Uh, in, in the example here, you see it's about two-thirds garage and, and one-third um, uh, livable area of a house. So by, again, by going down to, uh, by not insisting on a two-car garage, allowing a one-car garage, you could have a front-loaded single-car garage without the, the big impact. I think I've got one more, Mike. Um, no, now I'm going to turn it, turn it back to Mike to deal with some of those um, drainage areas. A couple other things identified here. One of the one of the larger ones, um, you know, beyond the the houses was the stormwater and grading, and uh, a lot of things were were brought up with that. One of was lack of stormwater control during construction, where in particular the uh, it rains and all the mud comes out in the street and how long that stays there. Um, also, uh, any new home topography can change the stormwater flow. This can allow additional storm water to neighbors' yards, and that's even though our code does not uh, allow that, it still happens. So our thought is there, can there some, be something else done there and more enforcement of the drainage plans? <coughs> also, retaining walls came up. Uh, one of the concerns was, and you can kind of see it in the picture here, of uh, cutting off tree roots. So this, this retaining wall went in. And you can see the trees right right beyond it in the neighbor's yard. And you know what happens to those trees now that that those are all cut off? Do they do they even survive? Or what's what's the incentive for the uh, person who built the built the retaining wall? What's what's their liability with that? Um, some alternative approaches to this would require an enhanced stormwater plan during construction. Uh, require drainage plan for new and adjacent properties. As we're seeing these go on all these 50 foot lots. Uh, one in the middle of a bunch can really affect all the other neighbors' drainage plans. So how, how, how can we, uh, you know, keep that similar to what was happening before? You know, we realize water goes on other neighbors. That's just what happens. But we're, we're concerned about, and, and uh, what we heard a lot was on when it significantly changes and you have a lot more coming onto your property. And, and uh, if you have a low point and obviously water goes there, does it creep into your basement, some other things. Uh, also on retaining walls, required engineered retaining walls, required reviewed by the city. Um, not sure if that's happening right now all the time. And then one thing potentially is to require on-site stormwater mitigation with no impact to the adjacent properties and or directing flow to the streets. So in other words, there may be 
store them storage on site or uh, much more uh, grading looks and swales to, to not take it into the neighbor's properties. So tree canopies, uh, tree canopy issues, some prote tree protection during construction. So you can see some photographs here thanks to uh, Commissioner Schroeder and I'm not sure where this is, but as you can see the the, the uh, dirt's all mounted, mounted around those trees and will they actually survive after all that? You know, there's really no requirement for any kind of construction hoarding or protection around trees right now in the code. Uh, concern of loss of tree canopy in older neighborhoods, uh, at least in my neighborhood, is you, there's, there's literally holes in the canopy now that didn't used to be there. If you get a lot of homes happening, uh, there's a lot of holes right now. and. Uh, um, it, uh, people had had a concerns about that, you know, just environmental concerns for these 50, 60, 80 year old trees. Uh, tree loss, carbon sink loss, energy conservation shading effects, urban heat island and, and also, uh, you know, erosion and stormwater control, what's happening. I see a lot of lots that have come in and they essentially clear them all out. Again, it's, it's property rights, but what are, what are community rights within that? So some alternative approaches is uh, t tree protection guidelines during construction, uh, providing a tree ordinance for new construction lot subdivisions. So it wouldn't necessarily apply just to your um, homeowner that has to take care of some trees, but it would apply when someone comes in and tears down a whole building that uh, you know it's looked at that they aren't necessarily clear cutting that entire lot. Uh, address discretionary tree removals. Uh, we've had, at least I've seen quite a few come in here where you know, you see a house go in, but then there's a couple big trees in the backyard, and you say, well, what are you going to do with those? Yeah, we'll look into it, and, and then they're gone when you when you go back and look at those homes. Uh, maybe there's an incentive to leave trees, um, require a tree inventory, and define preservation plan for mature trees, and then maybe at least require an equivalency planning plan for trees that are removed. So at least something's going back if you are removing some larger trees. Uh, I won't go through all these, but a lot of, again, kind of the 50% also that we heard was on home construction, the issues identified. Uh, really kind of the overall theme of this is that uh, residents didn't think the city did anything about construction on homes. In other words, it was the wild, wild west. Um, so there's, I think, some things that can happen there. Perceptions that there's uh, lax enforcement or no enforcement. Um, Overall concern on construction work hours, parking, street damage. You know, people are concerned on all the equipment that comes down the street, and then when they have to remod or the street gets redone, they end up paying for it because of uh, the street damage. So, some alternative approaches would uh, be to update the construction management plan, uh, create a city phone hotline for resident concerns, also log resident complaints and respond on the action taken. So, we heard a lot of things where Somebody complained, but they have no idea what happened. I think the city needs to get back to folks on, on what was going on and what enforcement action was taken. Also streamline overall enforcement process within the city department. So there's a lot of overlap. You know, planning might have a piece, um, engineering might have a piece, building construction. How do those all come together so it's a cohesive plan with that? Uh, require plan reinforcement retroactively. I'm not sure if we can do this, but we have a ton under construction right now. Can we go back and, and uh, require this? Uh, also, another thing, require builders to meet with neighborhoods or neighbors before construction. A lot of the complaints we heard was just the bulldozer shows up and tears that house down. They don't know anything about it, never heard about it before. And what does that mean to them? And, and how, how long is it going to be there? What's it going to look like? Uh, we also would uh, recommend, I think there are going towards that is more city enforcement on construction sites, visiting weekly, and I think the city's uh, in the middle of, in the midst of hiring somebody, I don't know if they have yet, Carrie, of, of more enforcement for that. Also, uh, creating penalties for builders that break the rules. I'm not aware that there are any right now. Um, so, you know, this is something that eventually that builder loses their license if they have too many of them or too many complaints that they're, they're doing that. Uh, heard some things on, you know, working, reducing construction hours. They go till 9 o'clock in the evenings right now, and can that be pared back a little bit? And all day Sunday is there ways to uh, not impact the neighborhood nearly as much. You know, I've heard about it a little bit now. You're, you're seeing even more homes that have um, heard two instances now where the, the teardowns are on both sides of them. So they're going to have two under construction and they're in the middle of that going on. I don't know if the city can probably can't limit, you know, when that occurs, but what, what protection can come for those folks. Um, and start enforce sidewalk maintenance. Um, potentially require a builder letter of credit for any public infrastructure damage. So those are some ideas with that. 
So again, back to our summary, the uh, new home remodels, the, the, the concerns we heard, and you'll see it in the notes if you look back in there, is most on the smaller city lots, the massing height, the setbacks, uh, grading and drainage, reduction of tree canopy, and then the other big piece of that, again, was the, the uh, actual construction impacts, particularly around debris, working hours, and parking. So, uh, you know, we're looking for some input from you if there's anything we, we have that we didn't bring up or things that uh, you want to add or any comments, but we're uh, really seeking your permission to go forth with these items to, uh, to go forward to the City Council work section session. Uh, we have some specific recommendations, and it seems like a lot of these really tend to be under common sense type of things. I mean, there's just a lot of stuff going on out there that really if, if people are more cognizant and uh, um, better wanted to relate well to their neighbors, I think some of this would, would clean up versus just kind of making the construction of Wild Wild West in our neighborhoods. So again, part of that is uh, enhancing the construction management plan, implementing a tree ordinance, uh, regulating the import-export of soils, improving stormwater management, um, subsurface surface and infrastructure impact, Again, as Ken mentioned earlier, no egress windows in the side yard setback. We heard a lot of uh, concern about that. Also require rear yard access from your own yard. Not There's some instances where you're actually, people have, the only way into their backyard is either through their house or their neighbors, and uh, something to uh, make sure that doesn't happen. And then potential eliminate requirement for two-car garage. You know, we don't know how many people would actually do that, but it seems with, with this day and age and as far as walkability and things, you know, that may be a choice for some people. Uh, general recommendations would be review the single residential zoning district. Do we need to add more? Is it fine? Do we regulate within what we have today? Uh, for lots under city minimums, uh, explore building area definitions. You know, do we increase the side yard setback as uh, Commissioner Potts spoke to? Uh, decrease the building height, maximum building height, modifying means of determining the height. I think that one thing had come up is, uh, you know, do the, the side of the house, does that setback go away as you as you um, get it larger, right? So you don't necessarily, that's forcing, I think, some of these buildings to go up in, in the setbacks. And then uh, make lot coverage limits more consistent within city code. So right now a lot over uh, 75 feet and 9,000 square feet is allowed 25% lot coverage, and lot coverage, lots under that are allowed 30%. Should that be consistent throughout the city? One thing for discussion. And also uh, establish front loading garage standards. And this could be a couple things, could be positioned relative to the front of the house. So you're seeing a lot of these garages, that's the most prominent feature. Is there something to be done so at least it doesn't stick out quite as far as they do right now? So that's the kind of the end of our presentation. Again, in the appendix we have thoughts from uh, all of our, our forums. There was about 25 people at each of those forums. We had pretty good attendance. There's a few council members there. And then along in here too at the end is uh, Morningside neighborhood. They have a small group going and actually they made recommendations particularly on the construction management plan which is down in the appendix too. So some of our stuff was from that but also those should be considered as we go forth as well. So I'll open it up to any questions or comments. I just wanted to add, uh, for anybody who sees that, that I'm really, I think that we've opened up a dialogue between the Planning Commission and the residents, and I really, really want to thank those people who have responded, who came to the forums, who've responded on the Speak Up Edina blog, and emailed, and I really encourage people, if they have more to say, if they haven't said anything already, either way, uh, we would welcome their input. So thanks to everybody who's been participating. I'd just add on to that that, um, well, first of all, thanks you, all three of you, for the great work that you've done over the last three months. It really, three months doesn't necessarily sound like fast, but in our world, it's lightning fast. So um, I think it's terrific what you've been able to accomplish in a short period of time. One of the things, picking up on our, what Arlene said, is you, you also reached out, I think, to a broad spectrum of stakeholders. You, you met with some builders, contractors, uh, realtors, um, in addition city to staff. city staff, in addition to um, residents, and I think that's really important to get the, that broad spectrum. And you know, it sure seems to me like 
one thing that you've accomplished is we've gotten our arms around the universe of issues here. You know, you start hearing the same thing over again. You know that you're, I, I suspect we're not missing anything now. The trick is how do you kind of collate it into some categories and, and um, figure out what the range of solutions are. And I think you've, you've got a great uh, start on a range of potential solutions. Any other comments from the commission? Commissioner Grable. Uh, I have one question. You mentioned, early, Arlene mm -hmm. mentioned earlier on that uh, you didn't think design review would be particularly practical or doable in the city. And I'm just wondering, wh what are your thoughts? Uh, what, what led you to that conclusion? I'm just kind of interested in hearing that. I think, at least among our committee, we all kind of shuddered and thought, who would be the design reviewer? And so, to be very honest, it, it sounds like it, it would be a fairly complex thing to set up in, for the city, at least citywide. It's one thing with, like Country Club, you have an historical overlay and you have guidelines so that a completely a new home that's built is subject to design review of the Heritage Preservation Board. But to do that when we have so many different types of neighborhoods and even in a geographic area on a block, you know, you go one block over, it could be very different. It would be a challenge, I think, to set something like that up. So that's pretty much. Yeah, we'll say even if you go to Morningside, you hear all about the small, uh, smaller homes and some other things, but you really look around there and there's much, there's homes from the 50s, the 60s, your traditional ramblers. You know, what exactly are you designing? What are you going towards even in that neighborhood? And that's probably one of the ones that would be closest together versus some of the other ones. So we just thought it was, you know, it'd be pretty difficult to have a clear sense of guidelines. You know, maybe if there was a new subdivision or something or, a, a, you know, a large uh, new areas, but there's really not. And, and the city's been developed so much over time that there's just a, such a huge variety of housing stock right now. How do you, how do you exactly do you pin that down? So that was our thoughts. I, I have some experience with it in the community that I work in has design guidelines for its commercial area. Um, and but not That's in where you typically area. see it versus residential right and it's uh, it's very challenging you need to have kind of an objective set of standards that fit what you're looking for and and some of those things you can do in terms of kind of characteristics about being pulled to the street front or percentage of certain materials like glass or brick or you know flat roofs instead of mm -hmm. peaked roofs etc but um, you do have to it takes considerable effort and energy to figure out what it is you're looking for and what you're trying to preserve and then to outline that in objective terms. And then the challenge in implementing it, of course, becomes um, resisting the temptation to design people's uh, projects for them. Mm -hmm. so. if, yeah, I might, uh, if I might, one other question. Uh, one might assume that the developers, the develop, com developer community would have said uh, everything's fine just the way it is. We don't need to make any changes. But what has been the reaction in your discussions with the developers? How how have they reacted to this whole effort? You know, f for the most part, they had some, you know, besides the everything's fine type of thing. They did have some pretty interesting comments on you know things that really don't work for them, and that was one of them was kind of the height and the the uh, what do you call it, carry the side sides. And a five foot setback for every foot above 15 feet, you have to step in. And that, that's been causing some issues with builders. And I think that one of the reasons you see so many A frames around is, is that type of construction, is that's what you kind of end up with in some cases with that. That was one of their suggestions. You know, the other thing I detected from some of the meetings was um, that the, the, the good builders are interested in more enforcement because they feel like they're following the rules and some of their competitors aren't following the rules and they'd like everybody to have to follow the rules if they're going to do that. Yeah, that definitely came up in the construction management piece of it. Right. Uh, you know, that was a big concern because they know if, if it gets too far out of kilter, there's going to be things that come down and probably should, but they were trying to really see a lot of people, you know, posting rules and really getting after subcontractors and other ones, not so much. So it's, mm -hmm. they're definitely seeing that. And uh, like you said, to your point, the good builders for the most part are already doing it. Um, maybe other ones aren't and is causing more, com a 
proportionate more sense of uh, complaints from other people, or pro right. much proportionally more. Commissioner Shearer. Uh, to that point, I, I, I was intrigued. As, as you went through your presentation, I made a list of things that were hot buttons for me, and, and when we got to the uh, specific recommendations page, um, all but two appeared, so I felt really <laughs> gratified, and, I'm, and now I'm going to mention those too, and one of them just plays on this last discussion. The, the construction management piece or the staff, continuing staff action or additions of staff action as we monitor construction that's going on, I guess I'd like to see that somewhere in the recommendations or at least a more identifiable, have I missed it? No, I mean, on this it, page? it was in the, we had it, sorry. We yeah. We had it on the page before, and I didn't specifically put it there. I, I think just, that's a real important, at least personally. That's I, fine. I would argue that yeah, that's I get what an important you're one to call out. Yep. And I'd love to hear the comments from the council members, because that won't happen without their support for the staff that will be needed uh, to make those kinds of changes. Um, and uh, another one that it might seem small, but the whole lot coverage and what we count, impermeables, et cetera, I liked your discussion of that earlier on in the packet. Um, and I, I, maybe we need a subsection or something that talks about the fact that a number of these items are going to, I hate to even say the, the words, but they're going to get at a code review again. Uh, things that will have to be you know, changed, added, modified uh, within the existing code, and one, one might, that we might look at might be that, how, how we're looking at uh, other surfaces besides the actual building that is on a lot. I have a little comment to that one. I have okay. a, a smaller house, but I have the garage in back mm -hmm. with the long driveway. So I got my rough tape measure out, and I measured, and my house is over 50% impervious surface right now. So that is one it's of the things that, we just... It's that trade-off. If you want yeah. the back uh, right. loading so garage, it's the back, you have and more actually, access to and it. I actually I measured it. my neighbors, who has a newer yeah. home. It's not full, you know, it's a good-sized home. It's got the garage in front. Mm -hmm. They had about 40% impervious area, so which is better? I don't know. That, it's a hard. It's a hard, it's a hard one. So it's a good one. It, it's when we brought up impervious area, we thought, well, there's so many that are non-conforming right now. Or are mm -hmm. we just fooling ourselves to to put it in? And you have all these that are already any anything with a with a back garage is almost guaranteed to be 50%. And, it, and, it, and you're right. It's a, tough on a smaller lot. Yeah, it's, it's tough on a smaller on a lot, lot. And you know, with deck and I really don't have that much yard that. The bigger home next to me actually has a much larger backyard because their garage is in front. Okay, interesting. So, but it would fall under. It doesn't have to be called. It would fall under that code discussion we would have. You know, the whole true. idea about a side yard setback, not including bay windows, egress windows, yep. making sure you have a full five feet or whatever number you choose from each home, so that you you're never going to have a problem of someone unable to access their backyard. Yeah, and one of the things we heard of too is uh, uh, should there be more for accessory uses like sheds. You know, it's three, I think it's three three feet right now. So some of these you see, especially in fifty foot lots, they're going three feet away. It could be two feet away, or you know, if there's a non-conforming condition, it's literally two feet away from the neighbor's window. And there's a couple instances we've seen of that. So are there things that need to happen in there as well? In the code lots? review, those could those could happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and one other question I have. Um, the report makes a lot out of the eliminating the two-car garage, the front-loaded issue. One of you talked about um, uh, feedback, a lot of feedback about this. Feedback from whom? A lot of people at the at the meetings. Although okay. you know, uh, Mr. Slidell was in here, and he actually did a neighborhood survey of Morningside, and 35% of those right now are front-loaded garages. They really? may not they may not stick out as much as some of the newer ones, but hmm. pretty much any fifth, any seventy style home has you know the Rambler type with the, even the tuck under has the garages on the front. Then they may not be as prominent as some we're seeing now, but there's there's a huge amount of them. So it's it's not a new thing. It, um, but I think it's getting noticed more on, on streets as just because they are a larger element of that front piece in there. For example. Well, I understand the aesthetics. I, I feel that in our community, we still have larger numbers of people that have multiple cars and or multiple toys. And, and I, the one thing I feel about garage doors is they provide places to put those things so that the rest of us are not looking at them all the time. You mentioned time. that earlier tonight. And I, I'm, I'm not, <laughs> I would say personally, 
I wouldn't be excited about eliminating the two car garage requirement. I okay. just don't see that as fitting with the people that live in our community today. Now that could be changing, but it's not changed radically in my observation. Yeah, our, our thought would, you know, it's probably more like on a 50 foot lot type of thing yeah. versus the larger lots. I mean, I, I could see that. Absolutely. So, yeah. But fair point. Yeah. Thanks. Commissioner Gravel. Just as a counterpoint, I <laughs> you based based on our previous uh, discussion, I, 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 I the thing that uh, I was impressed to see in this, or the thing that was very one thing that was very interesting to me, was the whole concept of the percentage of the front of the house that is taken up by the garage. And uh, it's not necessarily that the garage is front-loaded. It's that the garage takes up two-thirds of the front of the house as opposed to the 70s Ramblers or 50s Ramblers like the one I live where the garage is front-loaded, but it's, what, maybe 20% of, uh, of the front. Yeah, and, I mean, uh, and the idea of, you know, that we should encourage... I, I disagree with the idea that we ought to encourage uh, anything more than a two-car garage. It just seems uh, particularly when it's going to well we won't go there how about uh, less than two car garages though i i don't have a problem with less than two car garages or tandem garages uh, as opposed to side by sides you know so. one of the one of the dynamics i thought was interesting in these meetings that i attended was um one of the things that dawned on me is when you take the garage and put it in the front you eliminate a driveway, and so by definition, the house can go closer to the next door house. So the driveways had been, in some situations, acting as a de facto setback increase. So you had to have eight or nine feet just to get your driveway through. And when the driveway goes away and the new house is designed with the garage in the front, now the neighbor feels like the house is even closer. So. And actually, there's a lot of shared driveways, too, if you go... Yeah. Especially in Morningside, there's a lot of shared driveways, so it's eight or ten or whatever, and they both share it. So I'm not sure what you do in those in a rebuild situation. But the driveway either. does provide air and light as opposed to that tunneling effect. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think that. It's um, also pavement. Yeah. And I think Floyd's point, too, you know, when you have the, your kind of traditional garage on the front face of the house, but it's more of a horizontal lot. You, it, that doesn't feel, that feels right, that's fine. Uh, it's when it's a narrower 50 foot or less lot and then the garage, by definition, ends up taking up a sizable portion of that front facade. Commissioner Scheer. It, it'll be interesting in our discussion with the council, but more and more on a number of these issues, um, I keep coming to the fact that I think we're going to need to leave the one residential zoning district that has the same rules for everybody. I think the size of the lot is going to have have to have some impact if we want to control some of this. I mean, you could sure you could easily do that in one zoning district. I mean, it's uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, in one zoning district, but with a different set of. Codes. Yeah, I mean, it's it's of course it's by lot size, so right. you could just monitor it that way too. Mm -hmm. But uh, you know, far or a number of other things. I mean, yeah. there are ways to address all of these issues. We as a community have not ever gone there, and I, I'm beginning to believe that that's the only way we'll manage some of this. So one thing I'm going to add in here is the number of teardowns, too, which I don't have that graphic, but, you know, it, if you just look at it, there was about 60 or 80 kind of pre-recession, went down to kind of nothing in the recession. Now it's it's definitely climbing back up, and if you've been reading the news lately, and we talked to realtors here, you know, they said the housing market just exploded in Edina last March. There's really no uh, inventory right now in Edina, so that's what's that's really driving things right now. So it, you had that lull in there. I don't think it was ever going to, except for the recession, we probably would have ran into this years ago as, as something that would have come up a lot more. Now it's kind of back in full force. Yeah, on that point, we go to church at Christ the King at 51st and Zenith in the city of Minneapolis. And if you look at the neighborhood that's bounded by 50th Street and 54th, in Xerxes in France, there's a huge number of smaller houses being torn down and bigger two-story houses being built in that neighborhood. So it's not unique to uh, 
It's not unique to the city of Edina. The one difference in Minneapolis is they've got the alleys and the garages right. all feed off of the alley, so you don't have the front, uh, the front issue that we have here in the city. It was kind of interesting, too, to, I learned anecdotally that what's happening now is that because the financers, the restrictions that have, you know, the banks are more restrictive now after all this economic up, uproar and stuff, that it is almost easier for somebody to get a loan to, for, to build a new house than it is to do a major remodel on an existing home because you can prove the value. New house, it's worth this much, whereas, oh, you're improving, you're increasing the value by however much. And so that uh, some of the larger remodel jobs the numbers of those are going down as a result or you, because yeah because you can't get the financing for it so that now that and so some people think that's contributed also somewhat to this rise in teardowns it's like well let's just buy something and tear it down rather than buy something and really fix it up to fit us right so i i think um you know, we're at the place where we're pivoting from the information gathering and option exploring stage to kind of what to do next. And we do have a, a work session planned with the city council for March 5th. Um, and, the, you know, the object of tonight was to kind of get us all on the same page, see if there's any other information we need to gather. We do have a meeting on the 27th where we could add an agenda item related to this if folks thought we needed to discuss it further. Um, but then go to the council, and I think the point of going to the council at this stage is to kind of check in with them, report on what you've learned, and try to get any feedback if they think there's any course correction in terms of the direction we're headed. But then I think we'll be returning to, you know, to our work of trying to figure out which of these options we should pursue. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm anxious for input on thinking about a framework for how we approach that. You know, I don't want this to be a million details of different um, plans. I think we have to kind of organize it in a way that provides us, you know, you guys have done a great job of talking about construction management is one piece and then the land use regulations is another piece but I think even within the land use regulations we can come up with some categories yeah definitely Floyd yeah is there is there anything we that that you hear about that is missed in here or you know that that also should be looked at you know there's hopefully cast a fairly wide net and you know we're never going to get everything but Anything that jumps out as you is just not here. Uh, one one idea that I've had or that I've thought about, and it relates more to the enforcement of the standards, whatever the standards might be. Um, it'd be nice if we could avoid a situation where uh, somebody does something uh, wrong and then the, it ends up it's got to go to district court or something like that to get resolved. And perhaps the city ought to look at the possibility of establishing maybe an administrative hearing process so to uh, handle some of these you know complaints uh, perhaps funded by uh, bonds required of the developers or whatever so that you can have an easy not necessarily e not to be flipped easy but streamlined. an efficient and streamlined way to create an administrator or to create a hearing so that the, the issues can be presented and resolved by some type of an administrative law judge or something within the city itself and you get a resolution of an issue quickly as opposed to having you know litigation downtown that gets dragged out and uh, nobody's satisfied with it because it's too expensive and uh, too time consuming and all the things that all the negatives that go along with uh, with larger litigation. Well, that was one of our, not exactly, but that was one of our recommendations that there is a type of fine or something, you know, if you're construction management plan, if you're breaking something on that, it's a, you know, who knows, it could be a progressive fine system or something when you're cited for that. And, you know, the city regulates dog licenses and things, and we, we thought, you know, there's must be a way that we could we could put this within our, maybe it doesn't go in the zoning code, but it goes 
someplace else for, from that standpoint. And, you know, we have all your uh, legal expertise on here as, as to how we would do that. Right. But if the, for that. If, if, the city love, if the city levies a fine, then the developer challenges the fine and then you end up down in district court. If there's some kind of administrative process within the city itself yeah. where you do get an objective gotcha. hearing, yeah. Uh, it could be resolved much quicker and I think be more satisfying to the residents and, and probably that to the developers. Happens quicker, too. Yeah. I mean, it's. Uh, we have asked be. the city attorney to attend that work session on March 5th, Good. so we'll, we can address some of those issues. What time is that session? Five o'clock. So it's five to seven, we have the whole thing? Right. Five to okay. six thirty. Is there anything else besides this on there then? This is it. Um, other questions or comments? Yeah, you guys have done terrific work. I know it's been very time consuming, but I think you've really made tremendous headway. So I, you know, my thought would be we take this, you know, your presentation um, basically to the council, maybe forward it to them now so they have a chance to be noodling on it if they have questions they want to fire back our way before, you know, if they got it now and they had something before the 27th, we could even, you could alert that, alert us to that, Carrie, and we could at least be prepared to kind of focus on that topic. I'd yeah, like we, a little cleanup on this first. Okay. But. Well, I think the, I, I, I don't think we're asking them to make any decisions other than kind of tell us if, you know, there's something that sticks out that they just assume we not spend our time and energy on, and you know, the rest of the options go ahead and sort through them and give us your advice about what, you know, what they ought to do. So yeah, that that'd be definitely be nice to hear as to, you know, what time and energy where you where you put it. Right. I mean, we want you know, for instance, something like design standards. We don't want to. You know, that's a long, arduous process to create those. And so if they're not interested in that, we shouldn't be yeah. spending I mean, all that time. Again, we're not necessarily in favor of it, but yeah. there's a lot of, we're trying to bring people's thoughts forward too. So right. um, hopefully we got most of them. I'm sure there's little things here and there, but hopefully we got the, yeah, I, the themes picked up. I would encourage, um, you know, our fellow commissioners, if there's things that you think of that, you know, might be on the list uh, to get them to Carrie and Mike and, Get them included. Anything further on that item? I don't know that we need anything formal. I think this is a, I think we got a good direction. Thanks for all your comments. Thank you for your efforts. Can I just speak on one other subject? Sure. Quick? So uh, it was brought to my attention the uh, city of Minneapolis is actually doing some small area plans of the Linden Hills neighborhood, for example, and one of those corridors would be 44th Street as it, it goes down to France. So on the east side of France, uh, obviously on the west side is uh, Edina. Um, they're doing, uh, they have funding and money, and I don't know all the details for a small area plan of that area and probably like downtown Linden Hills and some other things. But so just a thought, and I was throwing it out, if, if that's something the city wanted to get involved in now and take advantage of, of that uh, across the street as well, if there's any synergy or something that could happen there. Carrie, are you familiar with that? I am. I've been contacted by Minneapolis staff um, as well as um, Cornejo Consulting. Dan Cornejo is, is helping work on that. <clears throat> and um, so I, they're just in the beginning stages, and um, they may be looking for some input. Certainly seems like something that we would have a lot of interest in being at least engaged in in some way. So maybe if you can keep us up to date on when they're trying to put that together and if they're looking for any participation from stakeholders on the west side of France. I'll do that. Any upcoming meetings or anything, I can send out yeah. an email. Yeah, All right. I know, I'm sorry. But it, I know it came out in the Morningside neighborhood update too, okay. so I got it to that, but I think there would probably be more helpful to have more follow-up as it. And I'd, I'd be curious to see if they're contemplating any formal, you know, outreach to stakeholders on the west side, if they're talking about that France corridor. And if they're doing a small area plan, you would think that they'd be interested in what people are thinking on both sides of the street. Uh, 
Next agenda item is correspondence and petitions. You have the council connection and attendance. I didn't see the attendance in here, but that's because this is the first meeting, right? All right. So we're all 100%. Everybody here is 100% as of today. Congratulations. <laughs> um, then we have chair and commission member comments. Any commission member comments that we haven't covered this evening? I just have a few I wanted to mention. Um, last night, I, uh, along with Commissioner Potts and Commissioner Carpenter, attended the ULI, ULI workshop with the council. It was tremendous. It was really this, um, for those who aren't familiar with it, the, there is a project that has, I think, received grant funding. Carrie, you can correct me if I'm off track here, but um, it was a panel of um, land use, development, design, finance experts, along with um, a couple of great um, kind of facilitator leaders from the um, Urban Land Institute. And it included a, a, a data dump of biblical proportions on um, statistics on demographics and the change and the um, the Gen Y versus the baby boomers and what how that's going to impact planning and how we ought to think about this. And I guess as I sat and listened to it, it was, you know, we spend so much of our time dealing with individual cases. It's just very valuable sometimes to step back and realize there's a bigger picture. And we are called a planning commission, and so we should be working to think about these things. So I, if people haven't had a chance to get the handout, I think if we can circulate that to the um, planning commissioners who weren't able to attend, it was a it was a it was a great um, a great effort, and I think stimulated some of the council thoughts and some of those. I don't know, Ken, if you've got anything to add. No, but we got it electronically. Yeah, did it, you? It wasn't recorded, um, but I do have a I do have the PowerPoint, yeah. and they're going to be sending me all that demographic information. And once I get that, I'll send it's it. It's staggering, to and it's and it's not just Minnesota and national, but it's also Edina um, demographic data. And I I couldn't even digest it; it was coming so fast. Yeah, and I guess the the only thing I'd add, I mean, it was great to have. I think we had the full council in attendance, and um, through the eyes of these experts, it gave us a chance to think back about the Centennial Lakes development and what some of the parts and pieces were of that 50th in France, how that came along, and uh, think about what lessons we might learn and bring forward to future uh, development work that we do. Uh, the other thing I wanted to mention, Carrie, do we have the um, buyer lease project on the next council meeting, or the next planning commission meeting? Yes, that is scheduled for your next meeting. Okay, so I wanted to alert you to the fact that that planned unit development that we saw as a sketch plan review kind of a year ago, maybe. So that is coming back to us as a formal application for planned unit development right. um, review will be at our next meeting. So set aside some extra time on the weekend before our next meeting to dig through that uh, packet. Hey, Carrie, can you include the notes from when that was in the sketch plan also? Yeah, I intend to. I'll, okay. I'll have the minutes. You maybe were the, already, but... And the council comments as well. Okay. And then the one last thing, as I was uh, thinking ahead when Carrie passed out the year's calendar, and I, I never think this far ahead, but I did see it. We do have meetings scheduled for the day before Thanksgiving and the day after Christmas, and I was going to ask the commission's permission to cancel those meetings. <laughs> Second. By acclamation. All right. So you'll thank me in about 10 months. So I have nothing further. Staff comments? None for me this evening. Thanks. Chris? Yeah, Jordan? All right. Uh, then I guess we're just looking for a motion to adjourn. Move we adjourn. All in favor, say aye. 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 Thank you very much.